So this talk was originally a five minute um, was originally a five minute lightning talk and uh, it was intended just to get something that was buzzing in my brain out of it and I had so much overwhelming feedback after the lightning talk that uh, these guys asked me to do a longer one and then I submitted it to PyCon and it got accepted so now I've actually got to make it a proper talk. Uh, so this is a bit of a practice run for PyCon of me trying to take a five minute talk and make it something a bit longer. Um, I'd also like to say my mum's here. And my mum's never, <laughs> my mum's Janine, and she's, she's, I don't think she's ever come and seen me speak before. So even though there's only like five of you here, I'm really, really nervous. nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll get into it. Um, oh, did you? Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. Um, so this is a bit of a family affair. This is my dad. He's the one on the left. <laughs> Just in case you couldn't tell. Uh, my dad has a habit of falling asleep in movies. And so I like to give him a bit of a hard time and say like he's seen the first half of every movie ever made. Um, I'm a bit of a chip off the old block though. And I'm fairly certain I've read the first half of most nonfiction books ever written. Um, I do nod off in them sometimes, just like Dad nods off in movies. Uh, sometimes, though, I just get distracted by a new shiny thing. Often it's a new shiny book, and uh, I just sort of forget to pick it back up again. But sometimes, sometimes you pick up a nonfiction book that sticks with you. And sometimes, even if they're hard to read or hard to understand, um, the content sticks with you and sort of compels you to finish. So sometimes the ideas from books you read get stuck in your head and they buzz there until you can process them effectively. And this is what this talk is about. It's me trying to process some of these ideas. Um, the book in question is called Adi and Holocaust. Feel free to have a flip through at a later, later time if you wish. Um, uh, so it was written a while ago. It was written in 2001. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of the book, like I wasn't up until early this year, uh, yes, it is that IBM, and yes, it is that Holocaust. Uh, my main takeaway from the book is that without this technology that IBM provided, the Holocaust would have still happened, but it wouldn't have been so well organised, so well planned, so devastating, um, so well executed, literally. Um, so, you know, when you see pictures of people who have been in concentration camps and they have a number tattooed on their arm, that number connected the human being to the punch card. Uh, it was the number that identified them in what was effectively a criminal case. Here's one of the bits I had to stop for a while to digest. In Holland, they had extensive Holleris machine infrastructure, these machines here, in the years before the war, and 73% of Dutch Jews were killed by the end of it. In France, they had very little cholera infrastructure. What they had was disorganisers competing product on the market at the time. Only 25% of French Jews were killed by the end of the war. In short, without IBM technology, thousands or millions more people could have survived Hitler. Of course, I'm sure you all know about the Nuremberg trials. Uh, they happened after the war ended. We remember those for the Nazis that got sentenced for war crimes. That was in the main trial. Um, and the statistics here are from the main trial, I might add. Um, so people like Hans Frick and Hermann Goring, which I'm sure you've come across it in school, if nothing else. Uh, so after the main war crimes trial, there were 12 more trials that happened in between 1946 and 1949, covered 177 people. People who were physicians, judges, military personnel, civil servants, and industrialists. Industrialists like Gustav Krupp, uh, he provided panzer tanks to the Nazis. Interestingly, it didn't actually slow the company down much. You probably know them as Thyssen Krupp now. They make elevators. Uh, it's a bit weird now every time I get into an elevator and notice it's a Thyssen Krupp elevator. I'm like, oh, there's that thing buzzing in my brain again. <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway, so you would expect, given that industrialists like Gustav Krupp did end up in the Nuremberg trials, that the people, senior officials at IBM would have also ended up in the Nuremberg trials. But joke's on you. The Nuremberg trials were pretty unique. They had to be conducted in four languages. 
and they were translated more or less simultaneously for the first time ever. Basically because it would have just gone far too long if they'd done it the old fashioned way. Uh, guess who provided the computing power for that to happen? Yes. <laughs> Um, interestingly, and for completely unrelated reasons, I was in Nuremberg last week and I took the opportunity to go to the Documentation Centre and Nazi Party Rally Grounds. Uh, fascinating tour, it took me about three hours to get through it and I had one of those moments on the way out. Uh, much to my dismay, IBM was not mentioned once. So, back to the book. It took me about four months to read it because I had to put it down every so often to think really hard. So during those four months, a bunch of things happened in the real world. Um, I'll go through these pretty quickly. Equifax admitted to a data breach of over 145 million accounts. Oh, I've got a typo there, it's 145 million. Uh, a self-driving Uber car with a non-attentive human driver ran over and killed a woman in Arizona. Uh, the Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal broke. Admittedly, it's been slow motion breaking since about 2015, but that's when it hit the mainstream. Uh, I learned that if you used the public Wi-Fi network at Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast a couple months ago, you had to log in with your Facebook account. And if you did that, you had to consent to handing over all your data to the Gold Coast City Council. They can't even be trusted to repair park benches. Um, a state-run university in South Korea partnered with a large arms company um, to establish a joint research center focused on developing fully autonomous weapons systems, otherwise known as killer robots. And I'll go through that in more detail later. My fitness pal admitted to a breach of over 150 million accounts. Uh, the American president tweeted, not that unusual these days. Uh, in this case, he threatened to use, quote, smart bombs against Russia and Syria. And Facebook, then again, um, moved the responsibility for one and a half billion users from the EU to the US. Why? because the US isn't quite so protective of user data. So, but I know there's a lot of smart people in this room, I'm willing to bet you've seen the connection between those things. <laughs> First of all, before we go on, I'd like to go through some more history, but with fewer Nazi minutes. So this guy, you might recognize his name. He was the guy who invented dynamite. He also owned a large weapons manufacturer, a manufacturing plant. Anyway, Alfred's brother died in Khan. And a French newspaper got confused and wrote an obituary for Alfred instead of his brother. Uh, it was pretty nasty. It was titled, The Merchant of Death is Dead. And it had this wonderful line in it, which I love. Uh, Dr. Alfred Nobel became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before. Uh, so Alfred read this, had what is technically known as an oh shit moment, and completely secretly went on to establish the Nobel Prize with his personal fortune. Uh, hilariously, he decided not to tell anyone about it. So when he did actually die, for real, everyone got the big prize when they read his will. Uh, here's another guy, Otto Hahn. He got the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1944 because he worked out nuclear fission. The prize really should have been given to him along with his two colleagues up top here. That's, oh, that's not going to work. Uh, Lisa Meitner on the left and Fritz Strassmann on the right there. Uh, the other two had to leave Germany in a bit of a hurry a few years before though, so they missed out. Uh, later on, of course, that technology was used to bomb Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and the entire world had an oh shit moment. <laughs> now we have ethics committees on chemistry. Uh, eugenics was the practice of sterilizing portions of the population in order to stop them breeding. Hitler was obviously a big fan of that, but I promised fewer Nazis. So we'll talk about before World War II when it was big in the US. Uh, 33 US states had sterilization programs in place against mentally ill people, disabled people, alcoholics, people living in poverty, and people deemed to be promiscuous. Basically, people in Americans didn't like much. Uh, some reports say around 65,000 Americans were legally sterilized during the first half of the 20th century. And African-American women were often sterilized without consent when they went to have other medical procedures. Uh, that was a bit of an oh shit moment for biology. The World Health Organization, or WHO, was created in 1948. It was the first specialised agency of the UN, which says something about how important they thought it was. Its mission is really multifaceted, but I'll draw your attention to this bit, which is in a bit of corporate ease, so forgive me. Uh, to address the underlying social and economic determinants of health through policies and programs that enhance health equity and integrate pro-poor, gender-responsive and human rights-based approaches. 
So if you missed that, basically what they're saying is don't let your government kill you and tell you it's good for your health. Uh, the United Nations also has an international bioethics committee. It was created in 1983. And among other things, it's to promote reflection on the ethical and legal issues raised by research in the life sciences and their activities. Basically saying eugenics was a no shit moment and so we did things about it. In a similar vein, some great drug failures like thalidomide made the idea of having better oversight on medicines seem like a good idea. Thalidomide was sold over the counter from 1957 and was recommended to pregnant women for relieving the symptoms of morning sickness. Unfortunately, it also created horrific birth defects. Only 40% of children born with defects survived and those who did survive were missing limbs, like in the pictures. Um, oh shit. Uh, court cases were brought against the manufacturer all over the world. There was a class action in Australia that was only settled in 2012, so that has been going on for a really long time. The US Food and Drug Administration was created in 1927, but it was the thalidomide cases that really strengthened their ability and their reach, and a whole bunch of other laws all around the world were impacted and introduced to address um, drug testing. We didn't let too many bridges collapse before we decided that civil engineering could use some regulation. Uh, in America, the National Society of Professional Engineers was established in 1932 and adopted a formal code of ethics in 1964, and they still litigate um, for civil engineering matters. And we only had one plane flying into a building to establish that maybe we shouldn't let people take box cutters on planes. So I'm hoping you're kind of seeing where I'm going here at this point. People very rarely come up with new ideas, new inventions, amazing new discoveries with the intention of killing or hurting people. It's the unintended consequences that cause the problems. Ethics committees and government oversight departments and legal rulings don't stop bad things happening. They help prevent them and they give us some kind of recourse if the worst does happen. Uh, consider these two cases. Volkswagen was caught out having written software code that allowed their car to cheat, cars to cheat emissions tests, which I'm sure you've heard of. Uber also developed software called Grayball, uh, which allowed them to cheat law enforcement officials trying to crack down on ride sharing. The difference is that Volkswagen software engineers went to jail. Uber software engineers didn't. Why? Because one is a car company and one is a software company. Startups especially like to use this phrase, move fast and break stuff. Uh, in IT, we talk about innovation a lot. We talk about thinking outside the box. I'm sure we all know a project manager who has said things like challenge paradigms or think different. It's all great. And I'm not saying that we should stop coming up with new ways to tackle problems or stop coming up with new ideas. But what happens when we step back from what we've created and we go, oh, chic? And what happens if that oh shit moment happens too late, like in the thalidomide cases? It's one thing to nix a project before it starts. It's quite another to nix it once it's in development, testing, or even after it's been released. So really, in my opinion, IT should have had its oh shit moment back when IBM provided the computing power to make the Holocaust possible. But IBM has been pretty busy over the last 80 years or so denying that any of it ever happened. And so no one really knows about it. Everyone I've spoken to about this has been completely surprised that IBM was involved at all. So there's never been a public reckoning on that matter. Uh, the development of the World Wide Web in the 90s, it was obviously very optimistic. Um, I'm not sure we can blame anyone for failing to see 4chan coming. <laughs> uh, we can probably, probably blame some of the social media sites for failing to see the dens of iniquity they became. Um, and we can certainly blame most of them for failing to do anything about it. Uh, Twitter's response to the incredible amount of white supremacism on their network has been at best ineffective and at worst non-existent. I find self-driving cars a particularly thorny problem. On the one hand, there are huge benefits to the technology, uh, the implications on the environment and on our society at large, but there's added mobility and independence for the disabled and that kind of thing. Um, it really could add a lot to our lives and to our society. But we haven't fully thought through the impacts. Most of the accidents related to self-driving features so far have been because humans just become a bit too reliant on the tech. And we do stupid stuff. 
like watching movies or reading or napping instead of acting as a, a last resort safeguard. So what happens when we rely on the text so much that we stop looking before we cross the road because we know the cars will stop for us? Uh, I have self-driving features in my car. Incidentally, I have a Volkswagen as well. And it makes stupid decisions all the time. I'm constantly yelling at it when I'm driving. I'm like, why are you doing that? There's, then they're just not smart enough to deal with stupid humans. Um, we just It's not advanced enough for us to rely on it. And I don't also don't think it should be hidden away until it's perfect either, because how else do you know that it's perfect? Uh, I looked into killer robots for a uni assignment a couple of months ago. Uh, it's another tricky one. Because the technology behind it's really easy to go, oh, killer robot's bad. Um, but the technology behind it is actually really useful. Um, it's also used for things like the self-driving cars, like we mentioned, aeroplane technology, medicine and surgery, and even peacekeeping operations. Uh, the idea of being able to drop care aid packages into war zones and that kind of stuff. So in the South Korea case, it came down to a bunch of universities signing an open letter, headed up by an Australian academic, incidentally. Um, threatening to, to boycott the university involved. So the South Korean government wasn't intending to step in. The UN didn't step in. Without an ethics organisation, what other resource is there to stop these things? As it is, we don't really know that the research has stopped. The Chancellor of the university write a lovely letter saying that it is, uh, but the weapons organisation funding it, this Hanwha, I've reversed that image and I'm not sure why, um, this, this company, Hanwha, has a lot of money and um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if they waived huge amounts of cash at academics to, to bring them back into the project in one way or another. It's all speculation, of course, I don't know, but that's kind of my point. There's no oversight, there's no regulations, there's no repercussions and there is a hell of a lot of money. Uh, Chinese surveillance, now this one I highly recommend you pick up if you can get a copy online or something of The Economist and read this article. Um, I've never heard of it before. It's been going on for some time. So I will try and enlighten you without mangling all the pronunciations. Uh, so Xinjiang is a province in northwest China, largely occupied by the Uyghur people, which I'm going to straight out say that I have mangled that pronunciation and it is probably mildly offensive now. Then I'm going to roll with it because I tried really hard to learn how to pronounce it properly and my mouth doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, so anyway, so the Uyghur people are the largest Muslim group in China. In Hotan, which is the capital of Xinjiang, there's a police station every 300 metres or so. Uh, this is one of them here. They call them convenience police stations. Uh, you can do things like charge your phone there. Um, if you don't think that already sounds like a police state, hang in. Um, every citizen has an identity card and at checkpoints around the province, police will scan people's cards, they take photographs and fingerprints, they do an iris scan and you have to unlock your phone and pop it into a cradle where it will download all your data for them to look at later. Uh, that's not just for people they're suspicious of, it's for everybody. There are four or five checkpoints every kilometre and people in the Hotan move through these checkpoints multiple times every day. Uh, another good part, <laughs> the roads are lined with poles every few hundred metres that hold cameras. The cameras watch pedestrians, but they also perform pattern matching between number plates and the faces of the driver of the car. Uh, if you're Wigger and you have done even a relatively minor infraction, you get sent to one of hundreds of thousands of quote re-education camps, um, which don't officially exist. No one really knows how many people are locked up in this province, but the estimate in this Economist article is 140,000 people. Uh, that's just in Hotan, in the city, not the entire province. Yeah, it seems to have come up a few times recently. Um, so locking up minority groups for sort of no real reason is by no means a new thing. We've seen this over and over again. Uh, the way technology is being put to use in this case, I think is the really interesting part. I bet the people who invented facial recognition technology have had several oh shit moments over the previous few years, at least in parts of China. And in case you were in danger of thinking it was only a Chinese thing, you may have heard of Palantir. Uh, they're the company that use minority report style predictions about crime. And because there are no pictures about Palantir, I had to use an actual minority report 
um, picture for you there, so you're welcome. Uh, so the Palantir reports were originally developed for the Pentagon. They used to identify terrorists in Iraq. That technology has now been imported to downtown Los Angeles, where it's being used to lock up brown people before they commit a crime. No, so it's definitely not just China. So while the increasing mainstream media awareness, uh, thanks to the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook stuff, has been really welcoming, and I've been it's been really exciting to see a little bit more conversation about this kind of thing. I don't think Cambridge Analytica is enough of an oh shit moment to actually change anything in our industry. I think it might be starting, but it's a very tiny, very tiny start. So what does all this have to do with documentation? <laughs> so glad you are. Um, you might be aware that after quality assurance, the group that finds the most bugs in software is us, the technical records. We are often put in the position of poking products that we don't yet fully understand in order to work out how to use them. It's the writer's job to come at products like a clueless user, poke things, bend them, use them in ways they haven't been designed. I would like to suggest that we expand that thinking just a little bit. How could I use this product to do harm? How could I use it to discover things about people I really shouldn't be discovering? Can I use this social product to stalk my ex? Can I use this platform, this API, this plugin, this app, this feature to do something that as reasonable, moral human beings, what's a little bit uncomfortable about? It's also important to think about using it in conjunction with other tech. Recognising someone's face is one thing, but when you combine it with GPS locations, government databases, purchase history, you have a completely different problem. And also the answer to why I stopped using shopping center loyalty. Only last week, I received an email while I was traveling. I received an email confirming my booking for a hotel I had never seen. Chris clicked the link, edit my booking. I couldn't see the whole credit card number, just the last four digits. I could have made this guy's visit pretty miserable though. I could have adjusted the dates of his booking, upgraded his room, purchased him additional spa services, a whole bunch of different things. I didn't because I'm a decent person. But the fact that I could made me think that it, it wouldn't wouldn't take much to make people do it just for the lols. Uh, just because someone mistyped their email in a form. If I can give you one piece of advice, it's don't read your marketing department's hype. If you do read your marketing department's hype, don't believe it. Nuclear fission has saved millions of lives through cancer treatment. It's provided light and power to billions. It's made surgery and even vegetables much safer than they That's what the marketing department wants you to know. It also made nuclear war a real possible thing, and the marketing department is unlikely to mention it. So question things, raise bugs, talk about it with your development team and your manager. Until software engineering has a real honest to God oh shit moment, like the Holocaust wasn't enough, and an ethics board with real teeth is born, you, the tech writers, are the forefront between technology that hurts and technology that, technology that helps and technology that harms. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Oh, that's my dad and I a few years ago as well, just in case you want an updated picture. <laughs> Schedule, <laughs> I'm just going to say the slim light angle um, mm. goes back to Nazis again. They, they Not research... surprised, everything I researched went back to Nazis oh, at one point. Yeah. They, they researched it mm. as a weapon, but they did, for whatever reason, didn't take off as a weapon. Yeah, I knew it was a German company, yeah. Um, but yeah, they basically built it for war. Yeah. <laughs> well, all the chemical warfare stuff was happening in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, right? Yeah. So yeah, that lines up with the with the timeline. Okay. Um, anyway, um, feel free to have a look at this, uh, which is about the the Chinese surveillance stuff. I got a lot of that information from. Feel free to have a quick flip through this. The passage on the Dutch versus French statistics is marked here, and that was one of those bits where I read it and put the book down and picked it up and read it again. <laughs> <laughs> so there was quite a few passages, but that was the one that really brought it home for me. So feel free to have a flip through that. Um, I highly recommend you pick up a copy of this off Books if you can. 
um, it would be nice if he did a new edition of that. So 2001 is the most recent one. And um, yeah, sorry to be such a downer. <laughs> <laughs>